Kanye West for president? Trump on Mount Rushmore? COVID-19 outbreak. And Black Lives Matter versus Antifa. Find out this and more coming up next. I'm Eric Mitchell, and this is To The Point. It's Military Monday, and it was July 4th weekend. As you all know, we had an amazing show on Saturday. Once again, want to give a shout out to my good friend, Air Force veteran and law enforcement vet, Mr. Philip Paz. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank all of you for tuning in on Saturday. It was amazing that you guys all stopped by to spend time with us before you took off and hung out with your families and friends and barbecued and rang in our nation's birthday. Today we have a great show for you. We have a lot of craziness going on. On Saturday, Kanye West announced that he's going to run for president in 2020. We also had the president on Friday say that he thinks his face deserves to be up on Mount Rushmore. Okay, I guess you did. It's not how it works. You don't get to pick yourself to go up there. You get picked to go. Eh, it's, it's a long story. We're not going to break that down. Uh, even as recently as this morning, the president has attacked Bubba Wallace who had actually nothing to do with the noose incident that took place, was demanding him and to apologize to the crews and also wanted him <laughs> to take the responsibility for NASCAR's low ratings because you always need to hear about network ratings from the president of the country. Usually you hear about ratings from the president of the company, not the United States talking about anyways that's a long story we also uh, cover COVID-19 record high numbers breaking out in states throughout the country you guys want to keep blaming it on what elected official runs the state whether they're Republican or Democrat I can tell you the outbreak is here because people aren't wearing masks I don't understand why so many of you fight masks uh, some of you Karens and Dave's out there love to say that the mask makes it hard for you to breathe yeah it sucks it's certainly not a fashion statement and nobody likes doing it but if it keeps people healthy and so we don't lose 41 year olds like amazing broadway actor nick cordero who passed away yesterday after a 13 week fight with it which included losing his leg nick was 41 years old it's if Broadway needed another hit, this definitely wasn't the hit. Losing Nick Cordero is an absolute tragedy, but it brings to light that we just simply have decided to ignore COVID-19. So many of you have now become doctors on Facebook and Twitter that you guys seem to be able to counter that you believe that Dr. Fauci and Dr. Drix are now against the president for political reasons. Y'all need to chill with this stuff. Quit with the conspiracy theories. Adam's show was closed on InfoWars. You can go check that out. You can draw, be crazy with him. I'm telling you, COVID-19 is here to stay. It starts with us making sure we want to keep small businesses open. As some of states have learned, you lose the right to restaurant dining in restaurants and bars because you refuse to wear a mask and follow simple rules. Folks, I'm not here to lecture you about wearing a mask, but wear a damn mask because you know what? It keeps people alive. It keeps the small business going. At the end of the day, that's what we want. Even those of you who proudly support the president know the president talks about that all the time. So do your part instead of being stubborn. I mean, even the president said last week, and I don't know why this didn't get more media coverage, the president did say, <laughs> I love it, he said the following, that he would wear a mask because he tried one on. I tried one on for the first time. Got to tell you, I look, I look ridiculously good in it. Uh, I kind of, yes, uh, I feel that I look like just a lone ranger when I wear it. Now, did he wear it? No. Was it fitting that he said the Lone Ranger before he went to Rushmore, which was held by the original folks that are technically here before all of us, the Native Americans? No. But for years, there's been zero White House that's given two shits about our Native American ancestors, that this land belongs to them technically, and the rules basically don't apply to them. And I don't understand why we've been bully pulpit and them around for years. But hey, that's a dog for a different day. So let's get to the point with our guest today. I'm excited to welcome to the show our guest returning and a good friend of mine, Marine Corps and Navy veteran and talk show host, cannabis advocate, 
MS survivor, just all around amazing human being and great American, a voice, truly a veteran's advocate, the great, the talented Montel Williams. So welcome to the show. Uh, welcome to the show, Montel. I don't know why I'm talking so fast. It's too many cups of coffee. I'm almost positive. How are you doing today? Good. How about yourself, sir? <clears throat> good. Do you have a good Fourth of July? Had a great, peaceful, quiet, stayed inside Fourth of July at my house with my wife. That, that's good, right? I think we did the same thing. Barbecued at our house. Uh, our neighborhood was like downtown Baghdad. Uh, it was uh, apparently all the governors telling everybody not to fire fireworks off was the opposite on the west coast everyone bought as much illegal fireworks as they could and celebrated by firing them off in their driveway which drove my dogs completely insane uh, and we had a safe insane there. one so we were pretty lame the costco ones that we were just kind of throwing out there and we're like yay neighbors yeah there was there was a lot of fireworks here they had little 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 bits here people were going to the park yeah so, everyone loves their fireworks but you know july 4th uh wasn't the same this year a lot of craziness going on. Our country is, uh, I would say, in chaos is the only word I really can call what is currently going on. Uh, I see you active. I want to start off because I just saw you tweet about this, uh, and he happens to be a brother Marine, uh, is being held in Russia, correct? Is that? Yeah, I think we've got another, you know, I've been involved, I tried to, my best to get involved in, you know, whenever we have a soldier being held in a foreign country and it doesn't appear that our government's doing anything about it. I try my best to see if I can get involved and see what I can do to help elevate not only the information and make sure people know about it, but I want to make sure people know we don't leave anyone behind. That's yeah. very true. So yeah, that's, that is, uh, I mean, but how did he get, ca I mean, why is Russia holding one of our own? I mean, have they explained why they're doing it? The explanation has been full yet. Let me get, let me see if I can get a little bit more information about it okay. right now. Uh, but yeah, I don't think the information is really kind of sketchy coming out. It, it's a crazy story. I mean, I, you were the first person to bring it to my attention. I was like, oh my um, goodness. Cause you know, anytime there's a Marine held, I of course see brother Marine, but Russia holding people. And I thought they were boys with uh, our president, so I was kind of shocked to see he's being held. Well, I mean, it's because, you know, they're boys just with our president because they're playing him. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, just like what we just saw, what's going on, the possibility of the fact that, you know, we have a commander-in-chief that's allowing a country to literally put bounties on the heads of our soldiers and denying it when our intelligence on the ground and our intelligence operatives have fully implemented ways to try to see if they can counter that in the battlefield. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying my best to think that we don't have a Benedict Arnold, but you know, if we have a double agent in the White House, we're in trouble. Whew. I mean, it is scary when all, I mean, have you ever, I mean, let's talk about this. You were an officer, obviously. Have you ever seen anything like this where you say one, the administration says one thing and all the evidence comes out, the Pentagon comes out and it's like, no, we briefed you like we've been briefing you for a while. You actually couldn't handle the briefing. So we cut back, gave them, we gave you the cliff notes version. It's, it's an insane. interesting world we live in. It's, it's insane. It's insane that, you know, we expect, you know, families to, to, to tell their kids to go on out and join the military and support and defend our constitution when our own president doesn't do it. So I, I don't get it. It, it it bewilders me uh, that these folks are this way. But what about Kanye West coming out and say he's going to run for president? He did that on July 4th, too. That's an, that's an idiot. You know, wait, hold on a second. I got John on the phone. Did you just tweet some? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, do, what's the story going on with the Marine that just got picked up in, in Russia? I told you about this one a couple of weeks ago. He's yes. been there for 300 days. He's in for 300 days? He's already been out now? Yeah. And exactly what's going on? He, he was accused of um, getting drunk and assaulting a police officer, but the, there's no evidence to support the fact that he actually did it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, so that that's a story right there by itself. And we wow. were talking about it. I, I kind of try to keep it uh, in the public eye. You know, I don't know if you know that over the course of the last five years, I worked with uh, Sergeant Tamarisi, who was being held in Mexico. I worked with uh, Amir Hakmati, who was being held in you know, Iran. 
I just worked with Michael White, who was being held in Iran also, and uh, we've been involved with the Levinson case and several others. And I mean, it's just the fact that we just seem to dishonor our soldiers when we don't have their back. And they're being held. But now, I'm sorry, I'm switching conversation. You switched over to Kanye West. No, no, no. We can stay on this one because trust me, it actually ties into something we've been very passionate on this show. Unfortunately, we didn't get the results we wanted, but we're talking about soldiers and people being mistreated and being forgotten. Uh, it's not just on foreign soil. It happens here. I mean, uh, one well, soldier in particular, Vanessa Guillen, she went missing for 70 days. And unfortunately for her family, and as all the guests on my show know, I've been very passionate about talking about this because the mainstream media didn't cover it. Our, especially the folks over on conservative side of the house had absolutely nothing to do with it. And they're the ones that will tell you so quickly that they served. They'll tell you by their tattoos on their arm and their books and their patriotism. But when it comes to a Latino soldier going missing for 70 days and her command lied, I mean, you as an officer, if you turn around and asked your enlisted what your head count was, and he said all present and accounted for, you would think that you had your entire platoon there. It turns out that person lied. Obviously a cover up that goes pretty heavily in Fort Hood, has a, I mean, there's so much here, Montel, to unravel. I feel like we're on your show back in the day right now, kind of unraveling sexual assault, sexual harassment. I mean, we had we had some ladies on our show, two service women. Uh, I'll give a shout out to both of them, Marine Corps veteran and door gunner for the Marine Corps, Lisa Bodenberg, and Army veteran Jesse James are on. They described what it was like to be female and be in our, our service right now as having to have shadows when you go to the bathroom because not you weren't worried about terrorists attacking you you were you're worried about the male presence attacking you look you know a lot of people don't understand that, that a large percentage of our homeless veterans in our country are women who served in the military who were sexually assaulted got no support got out and now they're living on the streets right now in america so you know it's a shame and and you know we have a Again, a commander in chief who claims that I've done more for the military, he's done more for the military than any president before him. It's a straight up lie. First thing, he never put a uniform on his own back. Number two, and he doesn't, he thinks that money for guns or money for ships or money for planes is supporting our soldiers, sailors, airmen, coast guardsmen, and marines when it is not. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, it's, it's appalling yeah. that we are living in a time when. There are so many who support this ridiculousness. And I don't and I don't understand that. I mean, we could probably spend multiple shows discussing how people fall for the gruff of just this guy who even this morning. Well, and I know I'm kind of subject hopping, but his Twitter feed makes it really easy to subject hop. It's like a squirrel. Uh, today, he attacked Bubba Wallace for he wanted him, demanded Bubba Wallace apologize to NASCAR and the crews that came out to support him for Black Lives Matter because according to the president, he made it up, uh, reported it falsely, it was a hoax, and oh, my favorite, made the Confederate flag look bad and of course had to bring up his ratings. The ratings of NASCAR are so poor. This is he, what you know, it's it's insane. Where he the, he lives in an alternative universe and an alternative, you know, reality where he thinks that he can just make up anything he wants to make up, and if he says it, then therefore it must be true. So you know, he, he dismisses the fact that Bubba Wallace admitted and talking openly and discussed the fact that he had never seen the noose, had nothing to do with the discovery of the noose. That the noose was found in videos from a year before, sewn on pictures. The fact that someone used a noose anyway, just period, is enough to say that there's a problem here. But then to turn around and bubba it, then blame it on Bubba is just another one of his lies, as blatant as his lie that says that 99.9% .9 of the people who have coronavirus are, uh, you know, just fine, and, and it, which is a straight up lie, not even acknowledging the fact that you know 120 something thousand people have already given their lives. Now, of course. If you look at it from a hard number standpoint, you know, uh, you know, we have 350 million people living in this country. 99.9% .9 of them would leave around 3 million. So therefore, we have not had 3 million deaths. So, OK, he could say that, you know, he's right when he uses that number. But that is the most ridiculous statement that anyone can ever make. And the fact that he's going to turn around and ask Bubba to now uh, apologize for something he didn't do, something that he didn't report initially something that he just was the victim of 
is another absolutely ridiculous, stupid thing. And why do we have a president that believes that our great heritage involved losers and tyrannists and people who were trying to destroy our country, who thinks that our great heritage involves and should be, we should acknowledge and, and you know, hold at high esteem those people who owned other people, those people who raped other people, those people who murdered other people, those people who then made an attempt at completely destroying what we consider a country because they didn't want to stop owning other people, raping other people. It, it, it's just beyond uh, the, the greatest pale. I can't even understand it. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Montel. I listened to his Rushmore speech and, and got really ill when I listened to his speech the following day held in Washington, D.C., simply talking about how he's backing the Confederacy, basically backing. I mean, I don't believe every statue should come down. I mean, I, like many Americans, uh, we watched Hamilton Friday night as a family, right? Great, 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 amazing story. And, and you look at a lot of it. Yeah, we have a lot of bad things, but Washington never law. I mean, law, Washington has a lot of negative in his bad, past, but not, he was a winning general. He, he still doesn't have an army base now after him. But several loser Civil War generals have bases named after him. And for some reason, the president and his people believe that you and I and our fellow veterans, it, we seem to fight for our bases, which I could tell you, I never once thought I'm going to give my life for Kanehoe Bay or Camp Pendleton. As much as I love both, uh, and we have beautiful views at both, I can't find a single one of us who's like, man, I would totally give my life for Fort Bragg or Fort Benning or the millions of others, it bewilders me the way that the people yeah. think of us military folk. This is just absolute ridiculousness. It is, it's it's beyond the pale of, of reality. This is the president who just wants to make sure that he can stoke the flames of hate. He thinks that this will be a better country down the road if in fact he was able to, you know, help start a race war help start a new civil war. He lives in a really just a, a fake, unreal, unrealistic globe of his own. And, you know, if that's what he wants, then he ought to pack him and his family up and go find a nice little slice of island somewhere and go live on it by himself. <laughs> I think there's a lot of us that want him to go do that. So yeah. let's, move on to the, let's move on to the other crazy. Uh, July yeah. 4th, uh, well, our... our our buddy Kanye jumped into the mix. Does anybody not understand the fact that this is a guy who was in the office extolling and, and, and talking about how much he really supported and admired Donald Trump? So why would we not believe that this is nothing more than a, than a one, a publicity stunt on his part? Because there is in no reality of any of just about the same, though, in the same reality that Trump has, thinking that he has the ability to be a president and leader of all Americans, for Kanye West to think for even one second that he has the ability to lead anything other than, you know, a a, a jam session or a, you know, recording session of his own music, um, you know, it, it's just, it pales in, uh, in being able to think about how he really believes that he could be the president. But if, in fact, he does continue to run, then I'd start to believe that this is more of a scheme contrived by Trump to help see if he can splinter off any portion of the black vote he can splinter off, knowing that his whole election came down to about 85,000 votes. So if Kanye West can help him splinter off 85,000 young African-American votes, he might feel like he is in a better position to win. That may be part of it. But anybody who doesn't think this is nothing more than a conspiracy or a part of Kanye West to help Trump, they're crazy. Yeah, I agree with you there. So let's let's kind of ride this wave. Uh, throughout the country, we still have protests going. I live on the West Coast. I live outside Portland, Oregon, uh, where we have had literally, they've been fighting the police for, and I say they, I say the protesters. Uh, but unfortunately, we have, Portland seems to be a hotbed for this group, Antifa. And I know Antifa is a very tough subject for a lot of people, but recently in an article published here in Portland, a leader of the black community, leader of the Black Lives Movement here in Portland, stated he was so heavily upset 
with Antifa and the police department here because Antifa, if you go look at the arrest of all the people doing the vandalism, throwing fireworks at police officers, breaking into the Justice Center, they are the whitest of the white kids. I mean, you've got kids getting arrested that are more silver spoon than, you know, either of us before we join the military, right? These are kids who they have everything. They 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 live white privilege, yet they're down there and they're actually hurting the Black Lives Move Matters movement. And that's that, I mean, that's my opinion is you take away from there's not one single black minority period. I went and looked. I was like, let me find an Asian. Nope. Let me find. Nope. It's all lily white kids and they're throwing, you know, they're the ones vandalizing. So there's this big conspiracy theory out there. Now I'm taking Antifa in a different way. I absolutely know President Barack Obama did not create Antifa. I, I know this. I know our president thinks that he did, which I don't know where he got that from in this world. Like but, makes everything else. <laughs> like it just sounds good. Barack Obama did that. I'm no like, problem. yeah. I'm blaming I'm blaming him for the Red Sox coming back on my Yankees uh, several years ago. I'm blaming him for that too. But you know, you got to you got to remember when when President Obama dropped the mic and called him out at the correspondence dinner, saying that you will never ever ever be president. That's what really irked him to his core, and that's what set him on this path. So everything he does is to try to see if he can, in some way, shape, or form, remove the memory of Barack Obama. You remember Barack Obama received a Nobel Peace Prize and Trump has, has denigrated the Nobel system saying that they shouldn't be even in existence anymore because he isn't getting one. He just stood in front of Mount Rushmore claiming that his face should be up there. You know, this is a guy who has an ego and is is a you know narcissist beyond the pale of narcissism. And you know, this whole movement, you know, first of all, let's back up for a second. You said something about Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. you know, Unfortunately, or fortunately, and fortunately, the name of the organization is Black Lives Matter. But had the name originally been said Black Lives Matter 2 with T-O-O, there wouldn't be anything that anyone complained about. But the fact the audacity that people of color wanted to say that they were as important as other people has now created this huge rift that, you know, we shouldn't have the audacity to think that my life is of any importance whatsoever. Um, I shouldn't have the audacity to believe that I've had any contribution to the building of this nation where this nation wouldn't be where it is had, were it not for black lives. And you, you referenced the fact that you, you watched Hamilton this weekend and Hamilton was done in a way where you had black characters playing, you know, some of our forefathers and some of those forefathers. And though we know that Hamilton himself may not have, we don't know whether or not he owned slaves himself, he helped to purchase and do the legal documentation for his wife's family that were slave owners, some of the biggest slave owners in the country. So, you know, we really have to kind of stop for a second and remember that, you know, America has had a race issue since day one. And when we fought the Revolutionary War, a lot of people don't even know is that a biracial person by the name of Crispus Attucks was the first blood shed on American soil. A black man gave his life first in the Revolutionary War, the first one to die. Thinking that that Revolutionary War and separation from England and separation from Europe would include him, but it didn't and would never have. And We've lived in a country that's dealt with race issues and have right under the surface since day one. And so what we're seeing right now is, you know, the line of demarcation where we're going to have to do something to get into the future or we will continue to watch this country fall apart. Well said. Very well said. I didn't know that about Hamilton, so now I'm going to go look that up. We should look up. I mean, there's there's a lot more about Hamilton that we need to remember, and a lot more remember, you know, who writes history. And history is written by those who are in charge. And yeah. until history gets written by collectively gathering fact rather than fiction, there's a lot of facts that we think are facts that really are fictional lies. So I have a random off the cuff question that I thought of the other day as I was preparing for our interview here. <laughs> I, I had to chuckle. It was my wife and I. So we're in our mid-40s. So we watched you growing up on TV. Yeah. 
And, and here's our question. And we said this, this was July 4th, the two of us sitting on our back porch. She looks over at me and she goes, Eric, you should ask Montel. When he was filming his show and he was looking at all the craziness that was going on in the world when he was filming it, is there a part of you right now that would like to be covering it, you know, the Montel to go cover today's craziness on your show? I mean, it seems to be completely opposite of the chaos of the days that you were on air. Well, I mean, there was chaos. Our society was going through its changes back when I was on the air. Would I, first of all, answer the question, would I love to be back on the air right now? Absolutely. But I got to tell you, I, I can't get arrested in Hollywood. You know, and I mean, I think people people would think, oh, yeah, Hollywood would love to do another show with Montel Williams. No, that's not true. Um, I've reached out to every network there is and, you know, made and I made several networks a lot of money. And just like you and your wife were saying, there are a lot of people who reach out to me all the time and say, Montel, why are you not on the air? It's not because I don't want to be on the air. It's because, you know, uh, for some reason, I just can't seem to break through to those who you know, need to have content to make them understand that my content would be a good contribution. Well, I like to- that's why you're always welcome here, man. You could you could take over the show as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you're the man. Uh, anytime. What I like <laughs> to be covering the issues of the day, what I like to have my perspective being heard today. Absolutely. That's why I do my own, you know, podcast myself, which is Let's Be Blunt with Montel, where we cover quite a few issues. And I'm about to, I think, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'm about to start a daily podcast um, where I'm going to be, you know, uh, the daily dose with Montel, where, you know, I want to be able to, to just talk about the issues of the day. It's just like what just happened with the fact that Kanye came forward and Elon Musk has stepped up to play and said he's back. And well, come on, remember Elon Musk backed Donald Trump. And why would he not want to back uh, Kanye West? Not because he wants to back him as an alternative to Trump. He wants to back him so that he puts enough money into the race to actually splinter the race the way it is. And if you splinter out the black vote and the minority vote away from, from uh, uh, Joe Biden, Trump gets an easy pass in. And, I, you know, let me tell you, it was this month, well, uh, yeah, July of 96, where I sat on a cable interview back before Trump even had the nomination. I, when, when I was being interviewed and someone was joking and saying, oh, he has no way. I said, you need to stop and you need to make sure you understand that he's going to get the nomination. And this guy could be the next president of the United States. I knew it. I felt it back then. And, I'm going to say it right now here on your show for all of those polls that are coming through right now, showing Biden in some landslide and, and showing, you know, support, supposed support for Trump going down. That's a lie. And, and don't believe it. It's the reason why you saw Saturday night on the fourth people, you know, enthralled looking like they were going to, you know, have a Beatles meltdown when he walked out on the stage. There are people who are, Jeff was interested in making sure that he gets another term in office as there were people who gave him his first term. And if you blink for one second, he may be right back in the same position that he's in right now in November. Uh, I don't want to think that way. You're gonna, uh, I need to eat a meal later on and I don't want to be sick. Uh, uh, it's depressing. I have a lot of people tell me about to quit saying this, quit saying this, you're manifesting this. But I'm here to tell you that what we don't acknowledge is the fact that there are so many people who I know are embarrassed and don't want to be on record saying what they're going to do when they go in that voting booth. That's and very true. That voting booth, they're going to pull the lever for him. Well, according to folks on uh, YouTube right now that are watching us live, uh, we have Marine Corps veteran Patrick McDonald. He says that his vote for 2024 is Montel. Uh, that's the hashtag that they're working with is Montel 2024. Just so you know, because you, you, you got some folks out here in YouTube land that want you to be president. Hey, I think it's a great idea. I mean, if Kanye could say random things out loud, so should Montel. So. Yeah, I, mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it. I, I would not jump out here and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to run in 2024. But I think if you put both Kanye and Trump in a glass and put a glass next to it with my with me in it, Mine would be more half full. Theirs would be more half empty. You know, I have the ability to understand international politics. I, you know, my degrees in engineering, got a minor in international security affairs. I worked as a Russian linguist for a while in the United States military and held the highest clearances this government has to offer and have worked the issue, not only Russia, but the Middle East and 
beyond. And so, you know, I think, you know, what we need is a person who can unite America. Um, we need that now more than ever. And someone who understands that it took all of us to get us here. And I, when I say all of us, I don't mean just African Americans. I mean, African Americans, Asian Americans, Indian Americans, Native Americans, you name the breed, nationality. It took us all to get us here. It's going to take us all to get us into the future. And I wish we would have someone who had enough wherewithal to finally go against you know, the current tide and say, enough of hate is enough. We've seen what hate does. Now let's look at unity. I love that. Very, very, very well said. Uh, let's move on to something that makes us both happier. Let's talk about cannabis. Because oh, that, yeah. that, that well, makes that, me very happy. <laughs> well, you know, I got to tell you something. It, I, I just literally had my dose of CBD before we came on. Uh, and I'm going to have my dose of, you know, combination after we get off. Um, you know, I think, A, if we go back and recognize that America was built on cannabis, most people don't understand this, from George Washington to Thomas Jefferson, to all of our forefathers, they all grew hemp. And some of them were noted to, if you look at George Washington, when you went into uh, back then the Mason tents, you know, Masons actually spent a lot of time consuming THC laden hemp in their evenings. And remember, you know, we lived in a different time back then. This was in the you know, late 1600s, early 1700s. There were no toilets. You know, very few people slept off of the ground. You know, you didn't get up in the morning and get, you know, uh, turn on a faucet and have water run out of it. No, 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 no. You normally waited for that pot of boiling water to stop boiling before you had a sip, because if you had sipped it, you would get some sort of funky, you know, virus or disease from the water. Most water in the late 1600s had at least one to two to three to four percent alcohol in it. Remember, we had, you know, beer that was was 3.2. We were drinking water. Babies were drinking water that were 2.1, 2.2 percent alcohol because you had to have alcohol in the water to kill all the bacteria. All the bacteria that turned into you know, extreme, you know, uh, diarrhea and, 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 and other forms of digestive issues. And so, you know, people lived at a time when they needed to have something to take their minds off of the, you know, hostile and, and, and extremely hostile environment that they lived in. And, you know, remember you were walking out in the woods and wiping your rear end, not with a roll of toilet paper, with, with a bunch of leaves. So, I mean, uh, you know, this was a time that was not but for the hardy, uh, hardy and hardiest. And so, yes, people walked around. If they had an opportunity to, to smoke on a hemp cigarette and uh, kind of distract themselves from the hostility of the environment, they did so. And not only that, but let's go back and look in the late 1600s. Almost every piece of clothing, every sail, every rope, was made from hemp. We ate a porridge every morning made from hemp seeds or every other day made from hemp seeds. Why? Because hemp seeds were noted back in the late 1600s as having the most, was the most, one of the most po protein laden seeds available to man. So when you couldn't go out and get your turkey running around in the woods and you couldn't shoot a deer and you know, you went three or four days without actually killing something, you were eating hemp seed to get the hemp out of it. And we were carrying hemp across the, we used hemp as a trading product, you know, with Europe. As a matter of fact, we were selling hemp because that's how they made rope. That's how they made sheets. That's how they made linen. You know, the word canvas comes from cannabis. So we were using hemp to actually create the world that we live in. And then all of a sudden, even when farmers tried to make tobacco the greatest exportation product, it wasn't. It was still hemp. You know, we were using hemp routinely up until the 1900s, until, you know, the early 1900s when, you know, you had people like William Randolph Hearst and Charles DuPont wanted to shift the technological world over to an oil-based and a tree-based product. But, you know, America was built and, and you know, developed on hemp. 
And so why do we want to stop doing it now? And I think you know, now that more and more research is starting to understand that things like hempcrete, other than concrete, hempcrete works and makes a brick that will last 100 years plus. You know, we know now that we're using hemp fiber and cellulose to create a filament for battery that we now understand holds more electricity than graphite. You know, this is a plant that has been giving and giving and giving back to humanity since day one. It's time that we jump aboard it and utilize it the way it should have been utilized. That, that, that is so uh, well said. And I, and I like that because I, I think a lot of people don't understand the background of cannabis. Uh, you know, there's those, those late, but I mean, here, and it keeps bubbling up and I don't understand. I mean, here's my question for you. And I thought of you uh, last week, AG Barr was uh, on the uh, prowl again, attacking cannabis, uh, of course, based on the West Coast, where basically that cloud of fog is not fog. It's all of us enjoying our cannabis. It has so many. Um, and I always argue with people who like it should be illegal. And I'm like, I don't understand that thinking, because simply even while you were talking here in the in the comments, Charity Brown, I'm sorry, I'm calling you out, Charity. She talked about using CBD and how it helped her get through a back surgery. I know veterans with PTSD swear by it cancer swear by oh, yeah, I mean, and to tell yourself you used it i mean you are with your ms i mean it's made you a whole you, i remember when you show, told the story at the vetties about how it changed your life going from where you didn't want to go to look at you now you're up on stage and you wouldn't even know it absolutely look one of the things about it that people don't get and understand is that again and i'm glad you're up on youtube and people are actually following this conversation and they need to share this conversation you know we and all mammals are born with a secondary sympathetic nervous system, for lack of better terms to call it. It's going to be called the endocannabinoid system. Inside your body, you make cannabinoids. And cannabinoids are what are the active ingredients of the marijuana sativa plant. And uh, they're also in hemp. And we are now identified well over 160 cannabinoids. But in our bodies, we have something, uh, two of them that we produce. We actually make, without ever having to consume any cannabis whatsoever, we make something called anandamide and something else that's called 2-AG. These are two chemicals that are inside of our bodies, part of the nervous system that's in our brain and in all of our peripheral organs. There's a CB1 and CB2 connector that literally allows for cannabis cannabinoids to actually antagonize our internal God-given endocannabinoid system that was in our body that we know now is part and partially and partly responsible for our cellular homeostasis. And what does that mean? I'm using big words, but the cellular homeostasis means the Goldilocks zone of all of our cells. So, you know, our cells operate, can operate too hot, too cold, and just right. Well, when we have the right amount of anandamide and the right amount of 2-AG, and they're probably going to discover over the next 10 to 15 years more and more of these uh, uh, endocannabinoids that we have in our system. When we have those, that's what helps boost our immune system and makes it work at optimum uh, efficiency. Now, in the last couple of years, people have jumped aboard just CBD, but we know that there are CBN, CBG, CB, you know, uh, DV, there's THCA, there's all kinds of endocannabinoids that all, when put together, working in a, you know, orchestra or, you know, in a, in a uh, together, when they work together in our bodies, they help our cells function at 100% efficiency. We now look back over the course of the last 100 years, Back to, you know, when cannabis was criminalized and it was criminalized not because it was a medicinal agent. It was criminalized because of the Marijuana Tax Act that was actually funded uh, by William Raptor Hearst and Charles DuPont. DuPont was trying to figure out how can we make that brown stuff that comes up out of the ground? How can we make more money out of that? Well, when they started doing that and they stopped people from actually consuming cannabis, We've seen the rise in, you know, uh, immunosuppressed disease and autoimmune disease around the world. And there are now science and real hard double, you know, uh, uh, peer-reviewed studied, double-blind studied 
information that's coming out in the world and letting the world understand that, you know, deficiencies in our endocannabinoid system is probably what's driving deficiencies in our autoimmune or the reason why we're getting so many autoimmune diseases. And so why would we not research something? Look, I'll give you an example. Uh, You know, if you think back in the late 50s and early 60s, there was a drug that was um, produced, and it was a synthetic drug produced. It's called thalidomide. And thalidomide caused all kinds of birth defects. As a matter of fact, it was created for, you know, uh, uh, postpartum depression and also for morning sickness. And it caused horrific birth defects. And so we got rid of that drug, got it out of the marketplace. And then in the last 10 years, we started to realize that that drug had a purpose. And it now has a decent purpose for, uh, I think, in cancer and also in heart disease. So we've been reintroducing thalidomide. Now, if we're going to take a drug like that, that's a synthetic, and reintroduce it because we found value in it, why would we not take something that's been used for, you know, cannabis has been used for around five thousand years you know at least three thousand years in in written history and and been used for everything from uh, almost every illness that you can think of um, has had some uses for it been written in the cornucopias and pharmaceutical documentation for thousands of years and not one death associated to it in thousands of years And we stopped even researching it back in 1937 because of the Marijuana Tax Act. We stopped studying it. We stopped looking at its value and stopped science from being able to study it because it interrupted so many other industries. You know, you can take a hemp fiber and remember hemp clothing lasts longer than any silk or any, you know, uh, 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 manufactured yarn or material than than anything else out there. And again, going back to the fact that everything from sails to ropes to, you know, the the coverings on the wagons that helped us discover the West were all made from hemp fiber. See, that's bananas. So real fast, uh, some folks out there, we have one, Charity Brown, again, loves your brand. You're, You're talking about THC and CBD, so she loves your brand. And we have a couple others. Can you, uh, where, where can folks find your brand? I know you were on the show the last time and we're talking about it. Yeah, right now I have a brand that's called Montel that you can find out in the marketplace in several places in California, Oregon, a couple of stores around the country are carrying it, but we are changing over manufacturing, uh, my manufacturing partner, and I'm about to get involved with another group that's going to start the mess. So we're not really in the marketplace as well as I'd like to be right now. Within the next three or four months, I'll come back on and we'll talk about where you'll be able to get it because we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm about to uh, maybe get get into a collaboration with another organization to make sure that I can make this available to everyone. I'm going to go find it here in Oregon since I'm in Oregon. That's my new goal in life. And then I'll take a picture and tag in it because well, that's, that's what I do for you. So before you go, let's let's talk about our favorite subject besides cannabis, which is veterans. Uh, yes. the greatest folks around in our eyes. So what can we do to help our brothers and sisters? I mean, our, our show is our Monday military Monday is one of our sponsors is vet pivot, which is an amazing podcast that is focused on helping veterans transition. So we solve, we work on that. And there's, that's a good focus. Matt Kachera is a air force veteran. He was a drill sergeant. And he knows I have to give him a hard time. Cause I didn't even know they had drill sergeants in air force boot camp, but apparently they do. Uh, but how do we how do we help veterans get through this? What is now a, it's almost a debil- debilitating state of you already have PTSD and now you're getting through COVID. And the news of COVID is depressing day in, day out. I saw some suicide numbers out of Ohio today were shared today and they're record high uh, for the last two months. So if that I don't know where they break down, you know how vets we don't always get included in everything. But uh, well, let me tell you, I'll tell you two things. One, let me go back to one of the questions you asked earlier. You can go up on MontelWorms.com and order my CBD product right now. We still have some product up there. You can get that right now. And I suggest you do. And that's one of the only CBD products I think like that 
initially I was one of the first to actually, you know, formulate a product that included terpenes and fats and lipids and make sure that you got all the essential uh, uh, ingredients that would at least help elicit the response that you're looking for. And I have a daytime formulation and a nighttime formulation. So you can go up on montelwilliams.com and you can order some CBD yourself today. Now, when it comes to veterans, I got to tell you something. I've been working on an initiative, and I told you this, Eric, I want to come back to your show to be able to announce it once we get this done. What if I were to say to you, and we're saying I'm, I'm a, you'll watch a YouTube page blow up here, I know for a fact that there is a cure right now for PTSD that is 90% efficient, that nine out of 10 people who participate in this cure actually find relief and get relief from PTSD immediately. And it, well, I'm sorry, it can be done in three days, three to five days, five days max. People have now come back a year to two years later saying unequivocally that they are cured of their PTSD. What if I told you that that existed right now, Eric? What would you say? I'd be all over it and tell you, how do we get this out? And let's go tell everybody. Well, brother, I am trying my best to, I'm reaching out, I've been reaching out in the next week or so to Secretary Wilkie. I've been reaching out to organizations all over this country because there is a program right now that is ready, available, it's ready for prime time, could actually be incorporated and in, 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 um, rolled out across this nation, and we could impact that now 23 plus a day suicide rate in America if this was implemented and provided to those who are suffering. And unfortunately, you know, we have such a daunting bureaucracy in Washington, D.C., led by someone who doesn't give a damn, that it makes it almost impossible to get any initiatives like this through. But I'm doing everything I can. I'm trying my best every day, trying to reach out, trying to see if we can make a difference. But I'm telling you, you heard it here, and I hope that it's quoted, and I get quoted over and over and over and over again. There is a cure that exists right now that, unfortunately, the bureaucracy is stopping from getting into the hands of those who need it the most, and we need to fight this. So I would say to every veteran out there, please, you can go up and just, just tweet your, your congressman, your senator, your, you know, your, your leaders and say, what is it that Montel's talking about? And let's get this thing deployed so we can start saving lives. So my team, we're going to cut this like almost immediately after finishing your interview, we're going to cut this and get that far and wide all over the socials and our team right now, just so you know, in the comments, Patrick McDonald, who uh, has PTSD is a Marine brother, just like you and I says, Wilkie will ignore you Montel. He's just another corporate hack who doesn't really care about vets. And I can tell everybody, uh, I was in the audience with my beautiful wife around some of the most amazing veterans in the world just three short years ago when Montel got up with the previous secretary of the VA and basically said that he was going to take care of vets and have the way to do it. One of the most powerful speeches I've ever been around when it comes to the veteran sector. It was genuine. It was beyond authentic. And it made everybody feel really bad for the secretary of the VA because he was the non-veteran sitting next to General Kelly, and he basically got his ass handed to him in a hat and had to sit through it while we all gave you, I believe, two standing ovations because you hit the nail on the head. So uh, I'm going to tell you, sir, it's really, it's, it really is insane that this program has been available. It's been worked out for the last 10 years. As a matter of fact, there's several VA offices actually support it 100%. It's been supported by the, the Blue Angels Association. It's been supported by hospitals around the world because it is so efficacious. This program is a doesn't include any drugs, doesn't need any drugs. This is a a one-on-one -on -one and we have figured out now that it can even be done, you know, uh, virtually, but it is a treatment protocol that's a one on one on one psychological protocol that literally after three days, the majority of veterans who participated in this program stated not what well, I'm sorry, nine out of ten stated unequivocally that they were already relieved of some of their symptoms. And by the end of the fifth day, cured. Now, what's it gonna take for us to implement something and then, you know, now let's talk about this. You know, right now, this is a, a PTSD and suicide is a three to five billion dollar industry uh, in this country. And this protocol would probably cost, you know, less than a billion 
to implement nationwide for all those suckers. You know, I mean, we, we need a pro- program that, number one, can train some facilitators. And once we train those facilitators, it's just a matter of how fast can we get you through the program. And I, I know that it's been successful, done virtually. And so how easy could it be to just come up on a website and go there for three hours a day and know that you're going to be cured? So how do we get the word out, Montel? That's the number one question in the comments. A bunch of vets want to know, how do we spread the word? Is there a link? I know this is, we're rushing it. You can make the announcement on our show. We're like, okay, he already has the website built. Let's go. No, I, I mean. Unfortunately, right now, uh, we lack funding, and we're trying our best right now. I want to go to Wookie. I want to sit down and have a conversation with him. I, I've been there to you know, the deputy head of the VA and talked to him about another program that I have that, uh, with the medical device that we know um, – uh, could actually literally change the way our soldiers are treated for any form of traumatic brain injury. We have that protocol. It's there right now. And yet, you know, it's still this uphill battle, uphill battle. So, you know, right this minute, we need funding. And uh, the funding has to be put in place so that we can get facilitators trained but I would say that if vets wanted to do something, I would start reaching out to Secretary Wilkie, reach out to the VA and say, look, you know, we're being told that there's a program out here that's available. Or it's a program out here that works. Why can't we fund this and get us help? And I just got pinged by three good friends who work in different military pubs, and they're going to run this when we're done. So that's awesome. We're going to get the word out to as many military folks. So you guys heard it here. Uh, we're going to push it. But like Montel says, reach out to the secretary of the VA, Wilkie, reach out to everybody you have, your congressman. This is a huge issue. And imagine if we took just a small portion of the $6.4 billion that they want to build a wall for whatever reason. If they just gave us a million of that or a billion of that or two billion of that, we could solve a lot of things. And we'd keep a lot of people alive who, who raise their right hand to keep us free. This program right now, this program right now needs about an infusion of about $20 million. And for $20 million, we would be able to, to start training facilitators across this country that then I'm telling you, I would bet that within uh, no more than a year, I think within a year, we'd be able to start knocking down that number of those who take their lives every day. And I mean, isn't that what we should be working to do? That sounds like a, that, that's where we'll end it. Cause that was, this is, uh, I'm almost speechless. That's what we need to do. That's how we save veterans. When we went down the path of talking about vets, Montel, you, you took it, to, you raised the bar again, like you always do when it comes to vets. You, you, you are a man of action. I will tell you that. And uh, that's why we love having you on the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us again. You're always welcome here, as you know. So uh, we'll have you on when you make any more announcements. And I'm sure we'll invite you back on again very soon. We love having you on. Everybody loves having you on. So thanks again, Montel, for joining us. Have yourself a great week. You keep doing what you're doing, my friend. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep keep sending the messages out there and keep us strong because it takes voices like ours to make sure that they know that they're not left behind. Thank you so much, Montel. That means a lot. Thank you, my friend. Talk to you soon. And wow, that's how you end a show with somebody that you look up to, a role model. Wow, that that's powerful. So uh, again, folks, let's uh, get the word out about this. It's very important that we share Montel's message. When it comes to PTSD, we've all lost far too many of those that we served with or we know of. I mean, I know I can fill my Twitter and my Facebook with a lot of negative news and that's always usually what I'm seeing is someone gave their life that came back. So if we have a way to get a cure, we definitely can find ourselves. Trust me, they can make a wrench for 20 K. We can find ourselves 20 million just to start knocking that number, that number down. I can speak English today. Uh, <laughs> we'll be right back here shortly uh, to close out the show. So let's get uh, right after these messages. And that was our sponsor, Vet Pivot. Vet Pivot is sponsoring uh, the show here. I almost called our show Life Flip. It is not Life Flip. This is to the point. <laughs> I found it. Life Flip. There we go. This is how we break down. But Vet Pivot, we want to thank them as our sponsor. They have an amazing podcast. Go visit them at vetpivot.com and follow all of their podcasts. 
amazing podcast to listen to. You guys know Matt Kachera is the founder of Vet Pivot. He's on our show. He'll be on next week talking more about veteran transition. Matt is going to start bringing on amazing guests for him to interview during our Mondays. Uh, obviously, I'll still be here doing some interviews, but Vet Pivot is the sponsor of our the show on this day. Uh, we're excited. We do have three new sponsors that are sponsoring on a Monday, on a Wednesday, and on a Friday. So we're excited. So Vet Pivot owns this day. So give a shout out to the boys over at Vet Pivot. We are very grateful for Vet Pivot and their founder, Matt Kachera. So uh, in closing, folks, it's that it was an amazing and powerful show. Uh, I apologize for some of the technical difficulties we started with. Now, uh, tomorrow we have a great show with Bridger Pennington. Uh, and Robbie Blanchard, two amazing entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs, they are going to tell you how they've made money. Because with 40 million Americans unemployed, it's important that we find a way to find our own resources and how to help each other. And part of my mission when we started to the point was to provide you guys with the tools in your tool belt to help you find the answers and develop a network for you to be able to reach out to, to provide you help so you can achieve the goals that you want to achieve. See, I've been able to achieve the goals and still achieving my goals every day, but it's important that we help each other. We reach a certain plateau. It's our job to make sure that we make sure everyone else joins us at the same level. That's the message of To The Point on an everyday basis. Why our guests may sometimes alarm you, frustrate you, make you bite your lip in anger, or you may sit there and go, why are we learning about this? It's a reason because I don't feed just one audience. We feed all audiences. We want everybody to enjoy this show because this show is about diversity and making sure everyone has a voice. So that's our goal here. I would like to say that during the show today, we did unfortunately receive news that uh, Charlie Daniels, the great country music singer, has passed away. And yesterday we received tragic news that Broadway star at the age of 41, Nick Cordero, passed away from complications of COVID-19. Uh, absolutely tragic and amazing actor, just like Charlie Daniels, an amazing country musician. Uh, drank a lot of whiskey and listened to a lot of Charlie Daniels in the Marine Corps. And that's the last time I listened to Charlie Daniels. True story. Uh, but... Those are things that uh, we remember both of those uh, people. Charlie was around, lived a very full life. Nick, we our thoughts go out to your family. And as always, our thoughts go out to Vanessa Guillen's family today. Uh, as uh, we saw yesterday on the news that it, the Army did confirm that it, her remains were found. They have arrested one suspect, a female, non-military. The other suspect was male, military sergeant. Uh, it's presumed he was the one that walked in on the shower. He's the one that bludgeoned her to death in the armory. He committed suicide when he fled from base. Again, why Fort Hood let that man off base? We still don't know. And hopefully these answers come out. I believe that the story goes deeper than this. And before we close, let's cover that for a second. This is an absolute 100% a cover-up. It's covered up from the other side. And I'm going to call out the conservatives because conservative media, you dropped the ball. You sat on your hands and did absolutely nothing. It took them finding remains of Vanessa for you to even step up off your asses and say a damn thing to anybody. You write cheesy ass articles. Oh, thank you, Fox News, for writing one freaking article about Vanessa. I'm glad that that's what a Latino soldier means to you, because clearly if she was a blonde soldier, you'd have this shit everywhere. You don't care. And we get it. You want to cover making sure your boy gets reelected. Regular news doesn't matter. You want to cover the story. That's why COVID-19 outbreaks are the worst that they've ever been. Florida had an all-time high again yesterday. But that's not what we're not talking about. We're not talking about COVID. COVID is COVID. We're talking about the fact that a soldier went missing. I've been very passionate about this the past three weeks. It's broken my heart that her family's had to deal with this, that her mother is bedridden because of this. And for the most part, this story will die off. But I'm going to tell you right here and right now, uh, to the point, this story will not be settled. We're going to continue bringing this to light because Vanessa, unfortunately, is just another part of this cog that continues to go on where women are assaulted and sexually harassed in the ranks and no one does anything. And it gets buried in the next story. That's not going to happen here because that's the difference between having me and some little prick who puts we the people on the side of his arm and sits there on Fox and has his little I have a book and I talk about how much of a patriot I am. Pete, you're not a patriot. You're just a dude who loves like clicks and shit. I don't. See, what I don't care about is I don't care how many people like the show. And I could care less how many people follow the show. I care about my message. I care about being a voice for people who have no voice. That's our job, Nessa and your family and anyone else who's been a victim 
of anything like this, sexually harassed, sexually assaulted, you have a voice on our show. You are more than welcome to come here and state your opinion and how you feel about any of these matters, because it is key that we speak for those who can't. And if mainstream media isn't going to do their job and report news that affects us, and if someone can send their son or daughter off to combat and thinks they're pretty damn safe by putting them on a base here in America, and they find their daughter torn apart and thrown into a shallow grave covered by cement, I think there's a lot we have to answer for. Don't you, America? Are we really, is this, is this the America that we're just fine with? We'll just move on to the next story. We all know if it bleeds, it leads. But when does it stop? When does the 3% that stand for our freedom actually get a voice? We ignore those who die from PTSD and suicide. We do it all the time. Just another one. As long as we do our 25 push-ups, that's what we're good. That We're good. We're doing our 25 push-ups. What do those 25 push-ups do? Well, you'll probably make a video about yourself. You, you might get some body weight mass there from pushing yourself up, but truly you're doing absolutely nothing. What you should be doing is being a voice, sharing maybe Montel's message, sharing our message, being a voice for all these people who are assaulted and harassed within the ranks that has gone on for decades. And because we protect those senior flag officers and leaders who tend to prey on the weak and new, this is why it continues on. And what I'm saying may not be popular, and you can call me un-American or call me a traitor, and I'll tell you I don't give a shit about either one because I love my country. There's three flags in my office alone on this set. There's many. In fact, there's one tattooed on my body. Don't question my love of country. Don't question my love of core. Love both to the bone. What I care about is being a voice. And again, let's make sure we keep Vanessa on the forefront of our hearts. Her family is going through an extremely tough time. Not only did they find Vanessa's body last week, but they announced it on the day of her sister's birthday and right before July 4th, which is all something held high. So when you see these photos of Vanessa going around, it's pretty powerful that, you know, she clearly wanted to join the army. She didn't do it because she had to. She did it because she wanted to. It's something that she always wanted to do. And to this lieutenant colonel that decided out of Wisconsin to make your remarks that her being sexually assaulted and harassed was just part of joining the boys club. You should be fired from your job at the University of Wisconsin. I hope you can't even get a job at 7-Eleven slaying Slurpees. You are the scum of the earth. You're what's the problem. You're like Jess James, an army veteran who was on our show two weeks ago said, is one of the problems. You are a female commander who looks the other way and you call people snowflakes when they report rapes and assaults. This is why it's a problem. It's not a male problem. It's not a female problem. It's a leadership problem. And it starts at the top. And until we can get a good leader at the top who won't shit on his generals and shit on everyone else and go on Twitter and have a rant about whatever the hell he wants and not focus on the issues at hand because a true leader would bring our country together. A true leader would say he mourns the loss of Vanessa Guillen, would mourn the loss of anyone else that we have. Instead, let's focus on Bubba Wallace and why he needs to apologize for poor ratings to NASCAR because at the end of the day, we should know that the ratings for NASCAR are poor from our president. But I don't have an answer to why the hell he even tweeted that. I don't. So anyways, guys, that's the show that we have for you today. Uh, tomorrow, great show. Great show coming for you all week long. As usual, we always love giving you great shows. We want to thank you guys again. We had a terrific show on Saturday. If you haven't checked it out, go check it out. If you want some good patriotic music, we had the one and only Air Force veteran and uh, law enforcement, I can say well, law enforcement, law enforcement officer Phil Paz had joined us and we were so excited to have him on the show. We're going to have him back really soon. Uh, did amazing work. As always, subscribe, share, click the bell so you know when we're on tomorrow's show, 9 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube. Make sure to catch us. We'll have Bridger Pennington and Robbie Blanchard here for our To The Point Tuesday we're excited for that. Make sure that you tune in. And as always, if you'd like to be a guest on our show, make sure you email us at hello at to the point tv.com. Go check us out there. Of course, follow us on all the socials, but send us an email there. We'd love to have you on. Or if you know somebody who should be on, give us their name. We'd love to have them on. Again, thank you to our guest today, Montel Williams, for stopping by. And for all of you who tuned in today, it means a lot to us. So on behalf of our entire team here at To The Point, I'm Eric Mitchell. Be safe. Be strong, be smart, and God bless America. This
Let's get to the point.